White Sox fan? Am I a real White Sox fan? Most definitely, yes. Been following oh, the whole season. Wow, that's great. It's good to meet a fellow White Sox fan then. You know, I just grew wow. up in that team. Just very excited. You can't see on my wall. My wife has taken them down, but I used to have like a framed Chicago Sometimes picture of them winning the World Series in 2005 on the wall. Yeah. It, it, um, to, truth be told, what it is is that um, I grew up in this uh, – um, town south of Chicago called Joliet. Dude, I'm from Joliet. Oh, really? Yeah, I moved out uh, in 1983, the year that they actually, you know, went to the... Yeah, they actually got uh, good. Yeah, good. so, so you know, you, you always become the fan of the baseball team that you grew up with, you know, during your childhood, and that's, that's, and that's how it is. So. Yeah, I was before you a little bit because I, yeah, I don't think people realize that Harry Carey used to do the games on um, channel 44 yeah you know and in 83 i think reinsdorf fired him and he went over to work for the cubs and the rest is history but harry carey used to be our guy you know and i grew up as a kid watching harry carey games and love the white Sox. just fell in love with them wow i know right Re- 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 reinsdorf sure uh, ch- changed quite a bit in a few that past decades he finally wants to win so that's yeah that's you're right about that you're right about that <laughs> Well, let's get to this, Matt. Sure. Hey, congratulations for the Starling. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So it's it, it's been a long time, long journey for you uh, for, for this film. It really has. You know, it, it goes back quite a ways. Uh, I used to think that the script was uh, just going to be used as a calling card for me for a long time. It got a lot of attention and a lot of people really liked it. They used to say things like this. We love this. It's nothing we can make, but it's something we would love to see, you know, get a lot of that from production companies and that sort of thing. And then there were times when it seemed like it was on the verge of getting made, you know, very close. They had financing, they had talent, directors, producers. And then, you know, it's really hard to get a movie made. That's one thing I've learned about this journey. It's really hard for all the pieces to come together. I think a lot harder than people realize too, you know? it seems easy, maybe, you know, because they make a lot of stuff, but it's really not. Well, at least that hasn't been my experience, you know, and I think the Starling's not necessarily something that jumps out at you as commercially viable either, you know, in that sense. And it's kind of a quirky dramedy um, and dealing with some heavy tragedy. And uh, so and it's, you know, it's a small story, right? You know, yeah. there's not a dramatic transformation at the end. She doesn't, you know, run into the hospital and pick him up and carry him out like officer and a gentleman at the end, you know. Uh, the the change, if you will, is, is is quite slight, you know, but it's a significant one, you know. Um, and that belief that, you know, you can uh, get past something, you know, horrible that like they did, so uh it's small it's very small and um uh, that's what I, I i liked about it i wanted it to seem small now the uh i thought uh make having your script making it onto that you know prestigious blacklist helps a bit doesn't it or it doesn't you know um you know it's probably even more so now i would say i think it gives it some credibility and you know in in this in Hollywood, everybody is kind of waiting for somebody to tell them that something's good, right? And that's how it kind of works. And uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a way of telling everybody, hey, this is good, you know, that other people like it. And so, yeah, in that sense. But, you know, again, uh, I think it's a risky project. That's why it probably it was made as an independent film and then sold to Netflix, you know, it had to be independently financed. I just don't think anybody was going to stick their neck out for it and finance it on a studio level and certainly not a studio level, but even finding independent financing, it was like so much depended on uh, who was attached and associated. And once you bring on a Melissa McCarthy, you know, then, it, then that's fine. You're not going to have any problems. And, you know, and, and the only way I really, was able to bring on Melissa McCarthy's because we brought on Ted Melfi and she trusted Ted Melfi and had worked with Ted and loved the script. And, 
you know, so the pieces did fall into place for me in that sense, but it doesn't, you know, always happen. So, so what sparked you to originally write this uh, script mm -hmm. for the Starling? Yeah, you know, um, I knew I wanted to write something. I was interested in writing something. I want to call it small per se, but I wanted to write something what I felt was real. And um, I had always kind of been, had this nagging awareness, if you will, that uh, the natural world is kind of indifferent to human suffering, you know, that bad things happen to good people. And uh, it just kind of gnawed on me. And I, I think being able to process that through story, you know, and trying to make some sense of it, I just came to me that like, you know, let's take that idea and figure out a way to, to use it as a theme and to tell a story. And once that happened, then the other pieces just suddenly started to fall into place. And I knew, like I said, I didn't want it to make it, you know, it wasn't going to be an ad exec on Manhattan, you know, Manhattan. He was, I wanted it to be a small character, small town, you know, maybe even like sort of the invisible people that we see every day, but don't really wonder what their daily lives are like, you know, and uh, I felt like that would make things a lot more relatable, you know, just every man type scenario. So it started small like that. And uh, yeah. Well, not, not a lot of people uh, check themselves into a, uh, you know, a mental hospital for, right. uh, for depression. No, no, it's true. You know, but there are some, you know, I, I had one advantage in writing this story is that I, I worked while I was going to college, I worked nights at a psychiatric hospital and I worked on adult units, adolescent units. I worked in, uh, you know, I even worked on a, a locked ICU. Um, and, uh, so I got to see a lot, you know, I was exposed to a lot and, uh, and on the voluntary unit, you know, for somebody who attempts suicide, unfortunately, they're, you know, given the option of voluntary admission, you know, or locked admission, typically. So, yeah, that's what, you know, it's, I felt like I could bring some realness to that, you know, and having, you know, some depictions of psychiatric hospitals that we've seen on film and TV, I don't think are necessarily too realistic. And my experience taught me a little bit differently, you know, the guys in the white jackets and sort of sterile conditions. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, to kind of accurately depict that as well. Were, were you pursuing like a psychology degree? Or no, I wasn't. I was pursuing an English degree, believe it or not. And working nights at a psychiatric hospital <laughs> allowed me to read, get caught up on homework and, you know, because patients were sleeping for the most part. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, but I had to read all their charts and then I would spend mornings with them. And then I started working some evening shifts as well. I'd pick up some evening shifts and, uh, you know, it was, it was a high stress job at times, more than I ever wanted. You know, I wanted to sometimes, but then sometimes it was just so fulfilling and so interesting, you know, and I, I learned a lot from the doctors and uh, therapists, you know, that were also there. And I saw the toll it took on them, you know, and I feel like that sort of behind one of the characters in the film, you know, understanding the impact it can have, you know, it's a, it's a field with a lot of turnover. Was, was the, uh, was the script always sort of like a comedic drama? It was. Yeah, it definitely was. You know, I think that comedy was kind of that Trojan horse, you know, that helped me deliver some of the, darker, deeper, more impactful tragedy that, uh, and also I wanted it to feel real too. You know, I do feel like uh, life can be a little ridiculous, ridiculous and absurd at times. And I think we try to uh, try to make sense of that as well. And so, you know, it's not all heavy, right? Like Melissa McCarthy was saying, like you, you cry at weddings and you laugh at funerals, right? You know, mm -hmm. what's up with that, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I, I tried to be true. That's what I wanted to be. Was, was it was it a struggle to balance that, uh, that fine line of, you know, comedy with a, such a serious subject? Like this? Yeah, very definitely. Yeah, and, you know, it was always been one of the concerns, you know, about 
who ultimately was going to direct this and who ultimately was going to, you know, you can, you can craft a lot of over sentimentalized or even, you know, overly melodramatic. Um, sentimentality is not a bad thing as long as it's true, right? As long as it's real, then it's okay. But, you know, I, I was, yeah, there was, I think it's a minefield, you know, is finding that balance. And I tried to write it with that sense uh, in mind and I tried to keep it, like I say, I know it's kind of a lame way of saying it, but to keep it real, but I wanted it to feel genuine, uh, authentic, you know, and I wanted it to be motivated by something authentic and not slapstick. And so, uh, yeah, I had to be careful about that balance. Now, why a starling? You could have easily chosen any other, you know, little creature or animal or yeah, anything. It could have been. It's true. You could, it could. It could have been a squirrel attacking her in the garden for all. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think it was a little bit of a. There's something magical about a starling as well. You know, I I've, I've seen those murmurations on the side of the road. I actually pulled over on a freeway or highway one time to watch that cloud of birds move and, and it's magical and um then the more i learned about them and how they cohabitate and how they are very territorial and invasive species and they just came to feel much more like some representation of what she was battling you know it's kind of hard to make your antagonist the universe right you know that's what she was sort of externally a waging war with you know and how do you do that? You know, this, and so that's where, that's where it came from, you know, plus Mockingbird had already been taken. So I just don't, <laughs> yeah, to it. not, uh, not, not doubting that part, but yeah, absolutely correct. <laughs> now, um, of course, uh, Kevin Klein was wonderful, uh, in, 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 in your film at the veterinarian, um, you yeah. know, former therapist and, and so on. What, what did you know about veterinary uh, medicine? I understand yeah. the, the, you know, the psych, psychiatric psych, right. uh, psychology. I understand your English literature part, but who did the veterinarian come yeah, from? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, uh, very little. Um, I, it's funny. I, I, I was, uh, when I was in college, I twisted my ankle really bad and needed surgery. And so... Uh, went back six weeks later to the surgeon to have the cast taken off and I was in his office and I looked up on the wall and there's of course a degree but said board certified orthopedic medicine and right next to it from the University of Illinois was <laughs> was the school of veterinary medicine and I'm like wait a minute what you know and then when he came in the room I was like are you a vet and he's like well Technically, yes, but I don't practice veterinary medicine anymore. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I just got operated on by a vet. This is crazy. And I guess that idea always stuck with me, you know. Um, you know, not much more than like having been a pet owner and seeing some of the compassion that goes into, you know, uh, being a practicing vet. So, yeah, I, I, wanted, I wanted that, whatever he was doing, I wanted it to be an outlet for the empathy that he still had that sort of empathy that was both a, a blessing and a curse for him in the field of psychiatry. Blessing because he was able to help people, but a curse because he couldn't help them enough and took on too much. And so he stepped back from that. And uh, yeah, that was his sort of burden. And I wanted her to be able to help him, him you know, get back into the real world a little bit more. I'm not not trying to reveal any spoilers, but uh, sure. does a can can a vet assist a starling in the first place? I'm 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 pretty sure you you didn't you didn't do any research and just made all that up. <laughs> I actually looked it up probably too much in detail, like even to the coffee stir, you know, the coffee straw. It was. Um, like the likely damage, I talked to somebody about it, would be um, a collapsed lung. And so how do you get into an interior sac? You would need something small. And if you didn't have those instruments, uh, they recommended a coffee straw, believe it or not, to basically almost like a tracheotomy. You go into a collapsed lung, you have to refill it. So yeah, 
believe it or not, I actually did research that one. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned earlier there were just a few slight changes from the original script that you wrote, uh, you know, a little bit more than 15, 15 years ago to what we actually going to see, uh, um, I believe, uh, this weekend um, with, right. uh, with, with the premiere on Netflix. Could you uh, tell, uh, tell us about those slight changes that you actually made? Yeah, you know, well, I mean, obviously the big change we made was we swapped the characters. It used to be that Jack worked at the grocery store and Lily would, had been in the hospital. And when um, our producer, Dylan Sellers, had what I think is a really inspired idea to, once Melissa had come on board and wanted to play Lily, uh, he was like, how can we make this a bigger role for her? And so he suggested that we change the, the roles. I didn't know if I wanted to do it, to be honest with you at that point. I was like, what, what are you talking about? Um, but Ted's like, just do it and we'll read it and we'll see what we think. Just go find, replace, you know? And as soon as I did, I read it, it just breathed a brand new life into the script. And I, I fell in love with the script and the story and the character change and kicked myself for not thinking of it sooner, to be quite honest with you. So it was a great idea. That was the biggest change. Um, you know, small changes here and there. You know, I think, you know, even at the time when I first wrote this, I don't think we everybody had cell phones. They weren't even ubiquitous. I think I, I got a note saying, you need to add a cell phone. I'm like, okay, I'll add a scene with a cell phone, you know. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, you know, small changes, I think, you know, a, making it a little bit more grounded, you know, in practicality. I don't know if that makes sense, but just to, to try to make, for some people, they, they struggled to understand what each of them was keeping them apart, you know, and I never wanted to try and hit people too hard on the head with it, you know, and I, um, so for me, I typically get notes that ask for a, a little bit more, um, on the nose, you know, if you will, uh, expression of something. And I'm like, the audience will get it. You don't need to tell them what's happening verbally. So yeah, some of those changes, those are always the battles, right? Those are always the things that keep you from, you know, keep you up at night. <laughs> the little compromises that you make along the way. Absolutely. And one more thing before I let you go, uh, Matt, uh, what's, what's your obsession with snow globes? <laughs> you know those things those treats have you ever had one i have never had one. Oh man you got to go to the store right now and just go get yourself one you'll understand it's coconut heaven right there they're fantastic i love them <laughs> yeah really do i can't believe you live in joliet i yeah i used to i used to live in joliet i, I moved out uh during elementary school i now live in uh fresno california oh okay cool where did you live in i mean uh joliet where'd you go to school um, I actually went into this, uh, there's this small town, I'm just outside this suburb called uh, Shorewood, and I went to this Catholic school, and then, um, and then an elementary school, I don't remember the elementary school, I think, there, think, this is think the crazy. town is Sh Shorewood, yeah. I lived in Shorewood, so wait a minute, I lived on Park Shore Drive. I, I, I still remember my old address, it was like 515 David Drive, but uh, wow. that's all I remember. That's good. <laughs> I'm coming. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Matt, uh, for, uh, for this conversation. This yeah, I appreciate cool. it. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. All right. Bye-bye.